Hello, so we are going to go over predation and competition, and we are going to start with competition, okay? So competition, um, there are two different kinds, but first, what is it? Competition occurs between individuals for a limiting resource. So what is this resource? This could be water, this could be food, this could be a home, like a cave, um, but it has to be limiting, okay? It has to be li limiting. And it's between individuals, all right? There's some somebody who wants it <laughs> and it's it's definitely desired and there are not that many around. What if the resource is not limited? Well, think of it this way. Let's say there's a huge pond, okay, humongous, okay, let's just say it's a lake, like bigger than Oroville, and there are, you know, five individuals that are around Lake Oroville, every other individual, this is like way back in time, okay, let's just say that there's only five individuals living around Lake Oroville, and they're using that as their water source, when there's a lot of water, nobody's really going to fight over it because there's plenty of water. Everybody can use it. The space of where they use it might be limited. So, um, you know, they might spread out, um, but the resource is not necessarily limited with that many individuals. But let's say we get, you know, 10,000 people or even more or 100,000 people. Now there is not enough water to actually provide uh, people with water just using that lake. Okay, so now it's gonna be limited. Um, you may need to increase the number to like a million, but uh, so yeah, so uh, the resource, if it's not limited, then you're not really gonna fight over it, okay? Just think of those five individuals with the lake. It's, there's no point in spending energy on fighting over it. Now, this resource is usually needed for survival and or reproduction, okay? So this is why it's worth fighting for, is it either gives you some way to survive, whether it be a home for protection, it could be an area to mate, um, which is uh, the reproductive part, um, it could be um, food, which is uh, definitely for survival, or even for young, for offspring, um, it could be, let's see, it could be many, many things. So um, let's see, a home. Oh, it could be um, some kind of protection too. So maybe there's so many individuals that provide protection for um, an organism. So they might be fighting over uh, protectors. Okay. Now, there are two different kinds of competition. There is intraspecific uh, competition, and this is when members of the same species compete, okay? Members of the same species compete. Now, I want you to focus on the word intraspecific, okay? So, um, you see this part here, intra, that actually means within, okay? And that would be within a species. So this is members of the same species competing. So this would be, for instance, two um, football player teams that are fighting for um, the win, which is, let's say, um, it's the Super Bowl. Um, they're fighting for the actual um, win for the Super Bowl. Only one team can win. So the limiting resource is the winning spot. There's only one. So all these teams compete for one spot and they're all human so that would be members of the same species competing for that win all right there's interspecific okay interspecific that means between between species so this is competition between members of different species competing so this would be um Let's say two dogs, uh, no, no, not two dogs, that'd be intraspecific. Let's say a dog and a cat, right? A dog and a cat are fighting over um, some land, okay? So my cat's very territorial, um, my outdoor cat, and it really likes to have the whole area to itself. So 
if a dog or a squirrel or anything comes around, he pretty much chases it away. So um, the limiting resource is actually space. Space is actually really interesting. Space is a big deal um, because communities and people even uh, fight over for space. Okay, there's only so much good space out there. For instance, flat land, um, places near water or food. There's really good spaces out there and space is actually not really thought about to compete over, but it's one of the main things out there that, that is, uh, competed over. So, um, my cat is actually competing for its space, which is basically its territory. Okay. Now let's look at a few examples here. So we have interspecific competition between, so this little thing right here means between two barnacle species. So um, if you notice here, we have a uh, Balanus. Okay, this is one of the, this is the genus of this type of barnacle. Okay, and they tend to be larger. All right, and then we have a uh, Thalamus, okay. Now this one is uh, the smaller one and it tends to be at the top. And this um, larger one is um, at, the, at the bottom. So they're, they're actually, um, if you wanna think about this, what do you think is actually limited here? So this is an area of competition. And what they eat is basically um, little al algae that's in the water. Okay, they kind of like filter. Um, so they eat things like that. So basically they just need water to move around. And during high tide, um, we have these species here getting, um, you know, a lot of the water and, and being splashed upon during low tide. Then these guys are getting a lot of the, um, you know, um, water and getting splashed upon. So basically um, there is a really good area. It's kind of like in between zone which is this area. And you can see here that they're kind of in their own area, but then in this middle region, this is the area of competition because they're basically clashing in their populations or running into each other. And this is where they compete for. If you um, want to think about what, what do you think is actually limited here? So try to think about what's really limited. Is it food? Is it the water? Well, it's really space. There's only so much area on this rock, okay? There's only so much to live, um, and they need to be on that rock. It's, they, they adhere to it in order to catch their food on the water. So really, there's, there's a lot of algae in the water at this point, okay? Um, but really, what they're competing for is the space to live. So um, this is the area of competition where they actually are clashing uh, to, um, to get that space. Now there is a video I want to show you. Um, it's kind of like, um, there's three different species. Okay. Now remember we're covering interspecific. Okay. We have species one here, species two there. So we're looking at interspecific. All right. So this is between species. So we have three species for this video that you're going to see. All right. So let me, um, actually, Get rid of all these so you can actually watch the video without any writing. So we have the leopard, the hyena, and the lion. Okay, so think about, what I want you to do is think about who do you think is actually going to come out with their, um, they're going to be competing over a food item. So I'm going to tell you what they're competing over. But guess right now who is going to be the one that actually gets the food. So go ahead, leopard, hyena, or lion. Now, Again, you're gonna. It's really just to kind of make this a little more fun um, to to see what what you think is gonna happen. Okay, so leopard, hyena, or lion. More than any big cat, leopards spend most of their time in trees. It's here that they eat, sleep, even mate. This leopard is in a tree in the Mala Mala Game Reserve in Kruger National Park, South Africa. The reason leopards spend so much time in trees is because other cats, like lions, kill leopards. And because hyenas and wild dogs love to steal their kills. This forces leopards to master the art of the arboreal scramble, never failing to know exactly which branch will support its weight. 
Yeah, oops. Well, almost never failing. Sometimes a leopard must maneuver himself and his dinner up a tree. The leopard has incredibly strong neck muscles that allow it to lug prey double or triple its weight up into its leafy home where it won't be troubled by scavengers and predators. You'd think that stalking and killing an impala would be the hard part, wouldn't you? But no. Turns out, the hard part is knowing which limb will support all that weight. And after all that trouble, an opportunistic hyena grabs the kill and scoots off. Okay, so the hungry leopard goes out and kills yet another impala and is trying to drag it up the tree. Another hyena chances by and decides to play a little game of tug of war. As you ponder who will win this struggle, consider this. Pound for pound, hyenas have the strongest jaws in the Mala Mala game reserve. Nothing is going to make this hyena let go. Well, uh, except maybe this, a, uh, <clears throat> a lioness. The hyena takes off, and the leopard immediately bounds upward with its kill. But the lioness decides that she has eyes for the prize, and also bounds up the tree. Survival here can be a subtle game. And this time... The leopard has gauged the tensile strength of the tree branches perfectly. Even though the lioness is inches from a juicy meal, she knows that she's too heavy to climb any higher. At last, the leopard gets a well-earned meal in peace. Wow, pretty cool, right? <laughs> so leopards have a hard life. Uh, you're wondering why why did they uh, not fight the hyena for the first kill? Well, actually, um, leopards, they basically have to um, run really fast. And over time, they don't have as much muscle in order to make them nice and lean in order to run fast. So actually, they're not as strong as other cats, as other, other large cats, okay? So that's actually why um, they actually can't fight too well um, to actually compete for their um, prey. Uh, it's actually why they're actually struggling right now because there's only so much prey they can kill. Um, some prey are too large for them. All right, so that was interesting. All right, so here we go. Here is another um, example. So we have um, Paramecium aurelia. Okay, so we have one um, species of Paramecium. We have another Paramecium uh, species right here. Now they're grown separately, okay, in their own dish. So these are little tiny one-celled organisms that um, they're, they got a, they, can, they can actually move pretty quickly, but um, basically they're in their own petri dish with food, and there's a whole bunch of individuals in um, in this dish. Okay, in the first in the top um, area dish, so we got Paramecium aurelia, which actually um, over time, so you can see the density of the population is growing, so more and more individuals are growing over time because this is time down here what's happening is we have a lot more individuals and eventually the population gets so big and it only can get so big it can't actually go bigger than this because there's only so much um, petri dish area so what kind of competition do you think that is if all these individuals are growing together okay in the in the in the um, petri dish and they're of the same species. So which one do you think it is? Intra or interspecific? Okay, so you really want to try to guess, test yourself, okay? This is only going to help. Um, your, since they're all individuals, 
of the same species, then it's intraspecific competition, okay, within species. So um, that's also the case here. So if you see this other species that was grown with just itself, like so a bunch of individuals of the same species, they were grown um, in a petri dish and then they basically reach capacity. So the, um, I also want you to think what's limited. So if they're in a petri dish, which is basically a little dish that's flat, and has nutrients in it. Okay, so it's just a little flat dish that has nutrients in it. That's what a petri dish is. So what do you think is limited? Okay, if you said food or space, you were correct. Um, they do have a limited amount of food that's in that petri dish, and then they also have a limited amount of space. So they can only grow so big until their population levels out, um, and then eventually when the food's all gone, then, you know, they would decrease. But if you were to keep all the food there, even they would still be limited in space and you can still only have so many individuals in there. Okay. Um, now when they're both grown together, look what happens. The blue one belongs to this species. So what happens is we have a winner, basically um, Paramecium aurelia grows and then this one declines and um, the it's not really a blue paramecium, it's just the color that they gave it to make it so you could see it as a different species. But Aurelia basically grows and does well, and then it basically eats all the food and takes a space, while uh, Cadotum basically doesn't do as well, and they will die out. Okay, so this one would be interspecific competition, because it's two different species, and space and food is still limited. Okay. So um, what I want you to do is watch this video and tell me if it's interspecific or intraspecific. Well, not really tell me, but think about which one it is, okay, as you're watching it. Open shells are highly prized. And this one is occupied by a sarcastic fringe head. These fish are exceptionally quarrelsome. They have to be to defend their living space. Inadvertently, it's wandered into the fringe head's territory, and that can't be tolerated. The octopus's impressive jab holds the fringe head at bay. There is more to this behavior than being bad tempered. The fringe head needs to defend its patch if it is to get enough to eat, and the octopus was competition. Crabs are not the easiest of mouthfuls. Because of the shortage of living space, there are constant boundary disputes, especially with other fringe heads. And this one has got too close. Despite the most extravagant threats, neither is prepared to back down. It's quick. 
shell. A fringe head can never drop its guard. There's too much competition. All right, pretty cool. So um, hopefully you recognized um, two different kinds of competition in there. Okay. Um, so we had interspecific and intraspecific. Okay. So if that's what um, you thought, then that's good. Okay. Um, so interspecific was between the octopus and the fringe head. Intraspecific, since it's between species um, or within species, intras within, um, that means that it's between the two individuals of fringe heads that we're fighting. Okay. What was really cool about this video is you also got to see predation, which is our next topic. Okay. So here's another uh, fun video that I think you would like. Uh, so what I want you to think about is there is a big beetle and there is a scorpion and they're actually going to battle. Okay. Um, so what are they going to battle? They're actually thrown together. Um, this is not done in the United States. This is illegal. Um, so, um, but they do this in other countries. Okay. Um, they actually put these two, uh, organisms together and basically make them fight. Okay. So the big beetle basically has these huge horns on the top of its head. It's a humongous beetle. Okay. It's not a little beetle. And the scorpion has a tail with venom. So um, what I want you to do is think about which one um, would win, okay? So go ahead and pick um, a contender, and if you were to place a bet, who would you bet on, okay? さあ、こちらえ、右側がトカラノコギリクワガタ。60 鹿児島県のトカラレッド出身であります。ハサミを引きちぎるのか。先ほどの国産カブトホワイトアイのアダウチか。トカラノコギリ。もうこれは劣勢か。ちょっと体液が出ています。イエローフォレスト。これは一方
briefly say that the the competition for this one was the space okay so um when we covered the octopus and and the inter specific and intra specific competition uh between the the actual uh fish then uh they were actually competing for space okay because there there's an opportunity when you have that space in order to get prey there's not that much around all right so that ends the first part of um, this lecture. The, the next part is uh, predation, okay? So um, predation is when one organism feeds on another, okay? One organism feeds on another. Um, well, what's the result? Well, the end of its life, basically. So um, this is why this is not a symbiosis. Pretty much one organism feeds on the other. It's the end. That, that's it. There's really no long-term relationship. It's, it's, it's food item. So um, this is just some interesting picture showing a snake eating a frog um, head first. That is the nicest thing to do. Um, being a snake, they consume their food head first. Um, and then they also... Um, this is also showing a, a hawk with a squirrel head. That's that's pretty crazy. So that death is is pretty fast. So in the animal world, they tend to kill pretty quickly. Um, there are some times where um, the death is is slower, but a lot of the times uh, the kill is quick, so that there's not a lot of energy being spent. Okay. Um, so there's three different kinds of predators you should know about. Okay. There's the lion weight predator. This these are basically um, predators that wait for a predator uh, for a prey item to approach and then they attack so it's kind of like they're hidden and then they wait to attack okay so uh, these are assassin beetles okay they are in the family reduviidae um, you don't have to know what family they're in I just I'm an insect person so I like to um, include that um, but anyways, um, they're also known as the kissing bug because they, in some regions, they transmit Chagas disease um, and they tend to bite around lips, okay, around the mouth. Um, but anyways, what they like to eat is basically some bees. So the bee comes around um, and basically what they do is they attack it, <laughs> um, paralyze it, and then they basically inject this needle-like uh, mouth part. Um, into the bee and basically uh, suck it up like a soft drink. Okay, so it sucks up the fluids. Um, you're kind of seeing a team effort here for this bee um, being eaten by these two um, assassin bugs. So these are lion weight predators. Okay, they wait for the bee to come flying by and then they basically attack the bee. They come out from their hiding spot and attack the bee. Okay, um, there are other ones out there. So let's look at some more examples here. Um, we have the sidewinding snake, okay? The sidewinding snake, you can find that in areas where there's a lot of sand, okay? So there's areas like in Southern California where there's sand dunes. Uh, so uh, the sidewinder snake like to actually go up the sand and they do it in an S format. So when they move up the sand, they kind of wiggle their body in like this weird lateral or sideways movement in order to get up the sand. And you're gonna see this in the video, okay? So here is the sidewinding snake. Oh, is it not gonna show it? Oh, I didn't have the link in here. Okay, it's okay. Um, but I could just tell you the story. So I think the link is gonna show up. I just, maybe I have to click on this. Huh. Oh, okay, so um, I'm just going to show you, I guess the, the video it was kind of long, so I'm just going to um, just kind of tell you how it goes, okay? So basically here are sand dunes, what I was talking about. This is how they actually angle themselves up. So they, they side wind up the sand dune. So that's actually how they go up the sand mountain, okay? And you can actually see these like kind of like S-like structures or, you know, um, impressions in the sand. Then what they do is they burrow themselves down into the sand and here's its eyes. Look at that. Look how good it is. Look at the sand and the color of the snake. Super camouflage. Look at that. Um, there's some more eyes there. So basically they, they wait for, um, oops, they wait for a prey item to come by, such as like a beetle or actually most likely a lizard to come skimpering by. 
and they pop out and they attack it and they um, kill it and eat it. Okay, so they're basically hiding right here, waiting. So that's why they're called lion wait predators. They're waiting for um, their prey item to come by, fly by, or however they come by, and then they jump out and attack. Okay. The other one, uh, type of predator, um, or the second one of the three that we're going to cover, is the pursue and attack predators. So this would be like your cheetah and gazelle. Um, so the cheetah goes out and it basically um, catches a gazelle, and it does that through speed. It basically runs right after it, and um, it's pursuing it by chasing it, basically, and then it attacks its neck and kills it pretty quickly okay so they're basically the hunters they're going out and they're chasing and they're killing and that's why they're called pursue and attack um let me see okay this is a video this one's really cool this is of a centipede versus a bat okay so a centipede does have venom a bat does not but it is a um it is a flying creature okay so it does fly around so go ahead and pick which one do you think is going to die? Because we are in predation right now, so there is killing. Um, so go ahead and pick which one you would put your money on, okay? This is one of these alarming giants. They were 13 inches, 35 centimeters long, and with the muscular strength of a small snake. And the poison in its black tipped fangs is lethal. <coughs> It hunts in the dark, bat-haunted caves of Venezuela. Like the whip spider and the velvet worm, it uses its antennae to feel for its victims. The beetles that swarm on the rocky floor of the cave are of no interest to it. It's after bigger prey. And it knows it can find that by climbing. Its many legs give it a secure hold on the vertical rocks. It's heading for the ceiling. Now in the darkness, it can sense bats flying past it. Holding on with its hind legs, it reaches out into their flight path, and almost immediately, it has one. An injection of venom from its fangs kills the bat almost instantaneously. It will take it an hour or so, but it will eat all the bat's flesh. Wow, pretty crazy, right? So that is the giant Amazonian centipede. They're over a foot long and they catch bats that are twice their size, you guys. That's so crazy. So think about this. It's kind of like your, um, just to show you here, we have how long these uh, guys actually are. So um, basically half your arm <laughs> up to um, the majority of your forearm. So it's pretty crazy how how big they are and this is it um, being showed with they have 42 legs but use 10 of those to hold on to the light lacking caves ceiling so this is in complete darkness you guys that they do all this um, and they catch bats while upside down I mean that's pretty crazy so the centipede won on that one and basically it is um, this is uh, basically gets the meal so <laughs> this is predation so it's it's definitely going to uh, eat you know, one of them was going to eat the other. So the centipede is the predator and the bat was the prey. All right. Our third and final category is predation by deception. Ooh, deceiving. So how can you be deceiving? And how could this cool firefly be the one that's actually so deceptive? Ooh. So basically this firefly is actually not a fly. It is a beetle. And if you haven't seen fireflies, this is what they do. They um, have an enzyme in their um, abdomen that helps uh, make a flash of light. Now we have the firefly family here. It's um, under the family Lampyridae. 
and they actually do not light where we live. We are in California. We do have a glow worm up here, but uh, the firefly itself, we just have the regular ones that do not actually glow. Okay, so here it is in the picture down here. That's actually a beetle, okay, and it's actually using an enzyme to light up its abdomen. So we have these guys, they just don't light up, okay? Um, but usually in the um, mid-America, this is where you would find fireflies. Um, people tend to catch them and keep them in jars, and then they starve to death. But <laughs> um, I don't know, I don't think they're feeding them. So fireflies have species-specific flash codes. What that means is that every species actually flashes it like um, a code, like it'll flash it one, two, three, and then move on. So for instance, number one, flash, 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 then it flies up, goes down, flash, 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 flies up, goes down, flash, flash, flash. That is its, um, basically its code. It's kind of like a Morse code, but it's in flashing code. And every species, so all of these are showing a different species on how they light up um, over their flight pattern. Okay, some of them do crazy blinkings like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and then flies one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? So it's like pretty crazy. And they also have sex specific flash codes. What that means is males will have their own sex, um, their own flash code, and uh, females will have their own flash code. And this is used for detecting mates, okay? So um, they use this flash code to be like, hey, baby, I'm over here. Let's make some offspring. Um, so uh, this is just showing you all the area of the firefly, okay? But again, it is a beetle. So how could something be so deceptive, okay? Um, oops. So what's happening is basically um, a firefly is a predator, okay? So these are actually predators, believe it or not. Now, what one can do is, let's say it's hungry, it doesn't want to mate, it actually wants to eat another firefly. So what it will do is it'll actually um, signal for a specific species. So some fireflies can actually have three different flash codes. Um, they can flash for a different species, and when it comes over, instead of mating, right, the male will be like, ooh, I'm going to come over and, and you know, mate. Um, and then it'll actually, instead of mating, it'll eat it. So it's kind of like, oh, you know, you want to mate, but I want to eat you. <laughs> so um, it's kind of crazy um, going through this, um, having all these different flash codes and, and hopefully, you know, they mate, but sometimes they are led to their doom. So pretty nuts. Um, so that is predation by deception, because that is deceiving, very, very deceiving. Um, then there's, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of herbivory versus predation. So can herbivory, so this is basically eating of plants, okay, be considered a form of predation? So is it that, or is it parasitism? Well, if the organism is eating some of the plant, it's actually parasitism. If the organism actually eats the whole plant, it basically predated upon the whole plant. It ate it, took its whole life. Um, then it would be considered predation, okay? Now, it could be parasitism that, that leads into predation where it eats it so much to the point over time that eventually um, it dies. So it could be parasitism at first and then predation after. So just to kind of give you an idea, um, that is herbivory. That's basically eating of plants, okay? Um, organisms eating plants. That's herbivory. All right, and I think that uh, concludes the lecture. So pretty cool. Um, so it was great um, seeing you guys. Um, I am glad that, well, I, I haven't shown my face in this one, but um, I'm glad that you were able to watch this, and I hope you guys have a great week. I will see you in the next video.